It is the 23rd day of December 2014, just two days away from Christmas Day. I'm Kamina Goro. It's an absolute pleasure to have you here with us tonight on Ebru Africa Primetime News as we take one in-depth and a comprehensive look at what's been happening in Kenya, not forgetting the African continent and the world over. I've got a jam-packed bulletin in store for you tonight. But before we get into any further details, let's have a look at the headlines. We must not allow those plotting against our freedoms and rights to get away with this coup. Opposition goes to court to challenge the new security laws. Ethics and Anti-Corruption Commission saves public resources worth 5.6 billion shillings from corrupt networks. This board has come up today to unveil the candidate for uh, Homer Bay County senatorial position and it is none other than Moses Oteno Kajuang. Cracks imagine ODM as party picks Moses Kajuang to contest the Homer Bay senatorial seat. Treaty is going to impose obligations on Kenya which may conflict with Kenya's geopolitical interests in the region. And treaty laying down international rules for the billion dollar global arms trade goes into force tomorrow. Starting us off, the High Court has dismissed an application by the opposition that was seeking to delay the implementation of some sections of the Contentious Security Laws Amendment Act. Now, Justice Isaac Lenaola directed the opposition to serve the Attorney General with the suit papers before he issues such an order. Now, the case will be heard tomorrow morning. Sam Gakuni reports. High Court Judge Isaac Lenaola refused to grant conservative orders as pleaded by the opposition to delay the implementation of the new security laws, saying he needs to hear from the respondent. Richard. The opposition argued that the new laws as passed and signed into law were invalid and unlawful. That the provisions of this uh, statute are inconsistent with the constitution. Judge Lenaola directed the opposition to serve the Attorney General who should defend the new laws and justify them as fronted by the executive. My view is that, uh, let me hear them, uh, you've not lost the opportunity to, to get any expert orders. But let me have them here uh, and we'll manage it uh, when they come in tomorrow at 11. Okay? The Coalition for Reforms and Democracy had moved to court seeking a declaration that the new security laws are null and void. Lead counsel James Orengo presented the petition under certificate of urgency. The opposition wants the laws struck out on the basis that they are oppressive, unreasonable, and unjustifiable in a democracy. Court also says granting the registrar powers to revoke national identity cards without following due process is dangerous. They further say due process was not followed when passing the bill because the Senate was not involved, yet security matters involve counties. Yes. The consultation between the two speakers for concurrence, whether a bill concerns the counties or not, is mandatory and is a necessary constitutional step. The other problem, according to the opposition, is that there was no public participation and that the bill was passed in contravention of Parliament's standing orders, considering the chaos that ensued in Parliament on the day the business was transacted. <laughs> Code Principal Raila Odinga says their next move as the case continues is to educate Kenyans on the ills of the bill. We must not allow those plotting against our freedoms and right to get away with this coup against the people and the constitution. In matters constitution, the court remains the only beacon of hope for proper interpretation. 
in this case a lot of interpretation will be required considering that court maintains that constitution was violated while the government maintains a hard line position of compliance the case continues tomorrow at 11 a.m thank you so much sam moving on the ethics and anti-corruption commission recovered public assets valued at over two billion shillings this year now in its annual report the commission also says that it managed to investigate and forward 68 investigation reports to the director of public prosecutions with various recommendations attached agnes gokonga has the details an annual report by the Ethics and Anti-Corruption Commission shows that a total of 22 asset tracing investigations of illegally acquired assets estimated at over 7 billion shillings were undertaken in the financial year 2013-2014. Out of these cases, assets valued at 2.068 billion shillings were recovered through court proceedings and out-of-court settlements. The Ethics and Anti-Corruption Commission also managed to save public resources valued at 5.6 billion shillings, resources that could have been lost through corruption networks. The Commission received a total of 4,006 reports, representing an increment of 19 percent from 3,355 in the previous year. A total of 144 forensic investigations are incomplete, with only 68 forensic investigations having been completed in this financial year. A total of 68 investigation reports were forwarded to the DPP in line with the law, an increase of 23.6% from 55 reports in the previous year. Of these reports, 44 are recommended for prosecution, 7 for administrative action, and 17 for closure due to lack of evidence. In order to prevent corruption at the national and county levels, the Commission carried out 84 corruption risk assessments. EACC also managed to advise at least 258 public institutions on the implementation of the Corruption Eradication Indicator, an exercise that was carried out under the Performance Contracting Framework. The Commission trained 90 Integrity Assurance Officers and 499 members of Corruption Prevention Committees within the framework of performance contracting in the public service. Under the Public Outreach Program, the Commission sensitized at least 72,078 pupils and over 2,000 students from 101 primary and secondary schools in nine counties on formation of integrity clubs and value-based character. The Ethics and Anti-Corruption Commission faced various challenges in the year 2013-2014. Among them is limited human resource capacity and forensic capabilities. This hindered the Commission from fully carrying out its mandate, which is fighting corruption and promoting ethics. <laughs> Lack of a national ethics and anti-corruption policy to guide the fight against corruption has been another hindrance to effective implementation of anti-corruption initiatives. <laughs> Slow adjudication of cases characterized by frequent adjournments, numerous judicial review applications and constitutional references also affected execution of the commission mandate on asset recovery. Now, screening for sexually transmitted diseases will be private and confidential as full range, full range testing can now be done through the internet or mobile phones without sharing personal information. Miriam Kanyugo gives us the details of how the recently launched Better to Know testing initiative is conducted. The Kenya National AIDS and Sexually Transmitted Infections Control Program shows that most Kenyans, especially the youth, prefer confidentiality and will not want to run into family or neighbors in health centers. 
For this reason, this form of testing is envisaged to offer confidentiality. Now, Better to Know is a company in the UK which deals with sexual health testing online based uh, program, which basically means that when someone wants to know the uh, STD, STI, HIV status, we basically, they basically just go online and what they do is they book onto the system there. It's all confidential. Lancet Group CEO Ahmed Kalebi, in collaboration with Mike Asha, CEO of Better to Know in the United Kingdom, introduced the technology to Kenya, though it has been on use abroad. The procedure includes the client being identified through an anonymous code during testing. We, our courier system will, our courier services will basically bring the sample from, from your home and we bring it here. It's all barcoded, so tests will be done here. And the reports will be filed through to the systems and to the Better to Know systems. Now, Better to Know uh, through their website, uh, because you're going to be putting in your details there, it's all anonymous. Um, what happens is they generate a PIN code for you. Now, this PIN code comes through us. We put it onto our systems, and whatever details that you've used onto the Better to Know website will be channeled through to us. Now, when they channel it through to us, we put it onto the system. We don't know who you are. So we put it onto the system, and we know the particular test or screening test that you want to do. It, for some tests, it might take three hours. Some of them might take three working days. And all goes back to, uh, to, the, to the website. You have your PIN code. Everything is there and you check your results. Those whose results turn out positive will be linked up with doctors for treatment privately. Now when it comes to treatment, for example, uh, we have specialists who are actually linked with us. So what will happen is anything that is found as positive will be filed through to the Better to Know team. And the Better to Know team will basically tell you this is where you will find a particular specialist for follow-ups and treatment. The results can be sent to an individual through a secure web portal or phone without revealing their identities. The tests have no age restriction, but underage clients will be required to sign consent forms. According to the 2013 Kenya HIV Prevention Revolution Roadmap Report, sponsored by the Health Ministry, at least 1.6 million Kenyans are living with HIV. With this online approach to sexual health testing, now Kenyans have their privacy and confidentiality. For Ebro African News, I'm Miriam Kanyuga. Now, the death of former Homer Bay Senator Tieno Kajuang left a huge gap in the leadership of the Homer Bay County, but at the same time created a perfect breeding, breeding ground for political chaos. Now, coming with the latest update from the Homer Bay senatorial seat by elections, Moses Kajuang will be ODM's flag bearer for the oncoming senatorial by election. Kajuang was handed the direct nomination by the party's election board. The move is likely to cause divisions in the Orange Party, with some of the candidates already shopping for new parties. After failing to pick its candidate for the Homer Bay County Senatorial by-election through voting, the Orange Party has settled for Moses Kajuang, the younger brother of late Homer Bay Senator Otieno Kajuang, as its flag bearer in the February 12th by-election. The National Elections Board, led by Judy Pareno, said the party consulted widely before picking its candidate. This board has come up today to unveil the candidate for uh, Homer Bay County senatorial position, and it is none other than Moses Oteno Kajuang. And we are glad to say that we have done our best in the circumstances that exist. And I still repeat that we use a direct nomination only as a last resort. Moses was facing seven other candidates, that is, Fred Rabongo, Karoli Omondi, Engineer Philip Okundi, George Mboya, Silas Jakakimba, and Dr. Oscar Kambona. Kajuang will be issued with a certificate later. All of them could not fit in, into one position. We had to make a very hard decision out of the best, because we had the best of all. <laughs> the party's nomination exercise was disrupted by rowdy youth, while an attempt to pick the candidate through consensus failed. The election commission has cleared three independent candidates, Hilary Alila, Professor Medo Misama, 
an innocent Misara who will also be going for the seat. Now, after two decades of advocacy and diplomacy, the arms trade treaty will now go into force starting tomorrow with Kenya as one of the nations that pushed for the adoption of the treaty and also delayed to sign and ratify it. The arms trade treaty, an international treaty that sets out to stop the flow of weapons and ammunition used to facilitate human rights violations, will go into force tomorrow with campaigners vowing to push its strict implementation. With armed violence being a major headache, many may wonder why Kenya has taken too long to sign the treaty despite being one of the first nations to push for its adoption. Colin Swanderi, an expert in international law, says regional politics could be the reason why Kenya is pulling away from the treaty. The treaty is going to impose obligations on Kenya which may conflict with Kenya's geopolitical interests in the region. In line with the new constitution, Wanderi says once a treaty enters into force, it will become a domestic law that might impose strict measures on the country as well as have implications on neighboring countries who use the port of Mombasa in transportation of weapons. In a hinterland country, that is Uganda, the Republic of Uganda, Southern Sudan, Ethiopia, Congo, Burundi, Rwanda, who wants to import any kind of weapons into the region was going to depend on the port of Mombasa and the transport corridor, that is Kenya. So this treaty is going to impose obligations on Kenya. He says the treaty is like the Rome Statute, which some African countries now claim is being used to oppress Africans. By refusing, sometimes you play international politics by refusing to play good boy. Because when African states signed the ICC treaty, uh, the treaty establishing the ICC treaty, they were playing good boys under international geopolitics. But now they have been the major victims, or rather, of, of this treaty. Now, they are looking at the, the, the treaty on, the, on, on, on uh, arms and saying, okay, wait a second. This treaty compels countries to set up national controls on arms exports and states must assess whether a weapon could be used to circumvent an international embargo, be used for genocide and war crimes, or be used by terrorists and organized criminals, and if robustly implemented, it could have the potential to save many lives and offer much-needed protection to vulnerable civilians around the world. A total of 130 countries have signed the treaty and 60 have ratified it, including Israel, which joined the movement just this month. Now campaigners are vowing to make sure that the Global Arms Treaty is strictly implemented. We're now joined on the phone by Justice Nyangaya from Amnesty International, an organization that has been in the forefront pushing for the operationalization of the treaty. Hello Justice, are you with us? Oh, hi, I am with you. Now first and foremost, start by telling us, you know, what is this treaty all about? Oh, the, the, the arms trade treaty uh, is very important uh, uh, to make sure that life and security and livelihood of people uh, are um, safeguarded. In fact, uh, uh, Amnesty International started campaigning and lobbying strongly 20 years ago for this treaty. And indeed, because lives have been lost, in fact, um, over 500 thousand lives are lost every year based on the irresponsible use of arms. And that's how important it is, because it will save lives. About five million people have died in DRC alone because of the irresponsible of uh, the use of arms. And lots of women have been raped Lots of children have died. Ma millions of people have died as a consequence of battles and conflicts that have stopped them uh, from getting water, health care, food in situations of conflict because of irresponsible use of arms. The arms trade treaty coming into force tomorrow is a godsend. This is really very important. 
uh, for Kenya, it's important for East and the Horn of Africa, it's important for Africa, it is important for the world. And that is how important it is. Now let me ask you, will this treaty realistically be effective, you know, in hauling in on some of the unprecedented and illegal movement of arms that have been at the heart of very many serious conflicts, leave alone just in Africa, but the world in general? I think it will. Um, uh, the, the, the member states will definitely um, uh, hold each other to account. When you sign and you ratify the treaty, it means, therefore, that the responsibility to make sure that uh, it is implemented to the letter is on you. And, uh, and so we really do hope that uh, the, uh, um, the situation that has been obtaining around the world that occasions 100 and, uh, uh, over 160 member states to sign the treaty and over 60 member states to ratify the treaty, that they will themselves hold each other to account. So far, there is nothing very serious to make sure that the states themselves hold each other to account, which then will mean, therefore, that the 2015 UN meeting on um, arms trade treaty will obviously call into play some of the amendments that may have been omitted on how each other and on how the member states need to hold each other to account. Yes. Now, we, it goes without saying that this is a very noble initiative, especially in light of, you know, what has happened in 2014 and the severity of the regional conflicts that we've been having and armed conflicts. What I want to get from you is, um, just as we finish up, what is the largest resistance, you know, facing this movement? you know, an initiative that the entire world needs. What's its biggest challenge right now in fulfilling its, you know, implementation? One of the biggest challenges, especially like I have said already, is uh, in the area of, um, of holding each other to account, but uh, also uh, where uh, various countries, and especially those that are producing um, large uh, military arms will actually be um, uh, transporting and exporting and transferring these arms to countries that uh, have asked them for support, especially a large catchment of, uh, um, of arms uh, that, were, that uh, are being planned to, to transfer from the U.S. To, uh, to, to Iraq, but also China uh, transferring large-scale military equipment and munitions to South Sudan, when South Sudan itself is extremely volatile, and it is a risk that if the, 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 the large-scale arms are transferred by the same government to the second state, that those arms will be used, obviously, on, on civilians. And I think this is one of the biggest uh, challenges that we have, that although there are those laws and policies uh, and restrictions and procedures within the arms trade treaty, the very same countries that have signed some of them, and some of them have not signed the law, will continue to do what they have been doing in the past, creating a complete uh, nightmare for everybody and i think this is one of the biggest challenges all habits die hard and this is what they have been doing in the last 20 years but we cannot expect them to stop doing this in the next uh, year or two years or three years because this is what has been happening and i think for me it is about saving life and making sure that people are secure and that is the responsibility of government to ensure that security of the ordinary person is secured by a responsible government. Thank you so, so much, Justice, for your insights. Trust we will be keeping in touch with you to get even more on the Global Arms Treaty. Now, that was Justice Nyangaya from Amnesty International.
Now moving on, booze business is booming for set-top box sellers in Nairobi as Kenyans rush to buy digital set boxes ahead of next week's deadline. Now, the government has ruled out any extension after December 31st. Eunice Moy reports. The analog switch-off in the city is set for 31st of December 2014, and with it comes the last-minute rush of meeting the deadline. Especially after the Communication Authority of Kenya said the deadline will not be extended. Monday, the government rolled out a sensitization program with the ICT Cabinet Secretary Fred Matiangi urging Kenyans, especially in Nairobi, to embrace the digital migration process by buying digital set boxes before Wednesday next week. So we will work together. I am confident we will meet the world deadline of June 2015. And we will finally migrate. I hope that in the new year, one of the things we are going to follow suit immediately to release as a ministry is now the new spectrum management guideline. Kenyans eager to meet the deadline have to part with between 199 shillings and 6,000 shillings as they seek to comply before the deadline. For the sellers though, business is booming. Kile kitu na sema sales is easy, the coders, even any, most legal and startups zinaenda faster from last week. The sales are high. People what wanna kuja wana no na jua Kenyan people wanna go ja rushing hours na bay now villa or meteremusha. So wana no yeah business is good on that side. Nairobi will be the first to go digital, followed by media town across the country by February, and then the rest of the country by March next year. <laughs> All countries signatory to the Geneva 2006 agreement must migrate from analog to digital broadcasting services by 2015. With only seven days left to the digital migration deadline set for next week, the hassle of getting the set boxes here in Nairobi has intensified, especially after the directive by the Communication Authority of Kenya that those who will not have complied by next week will be switched off. Reporting for Ebru, Africa TV in Nairobi, I'm Eunice Moy. We now move to a short commercial break, but don't you go anywhere. Trust we've got so much more lined up for you on Ebru, Africa, primetime news. Welcome back to Ebru Africa Primetime News. We now take a look at news making waves across the African continent. Starting us off, Tanzanian President Jakaya Kikwete has fired a senior cabinet minister over a graft scandal in the energy sector that has already led to the resignation of the African country's attorney general. Nakikwete dismissed Anna Tibaijuka, Ministry of Minister of Lands, Housing and Human Settlements Development, after she allegedly accepted a $1 million payment from a Tanzanian businessman that was linked to a controversial energy deal. The President of the United Republic of Tanzania, Dr. Jakaya Amrusha Kikwete, has sacked the Minister for Land, Housing and Human Settlements Development, Professor Anna Tibaijuka, over her involvement in the controversial Tegeta escrow account saga. Professor Tibaijuka, who is the former Under Secretary General for the United Nations Habitat, is accused of receiving over one million U.S. dollars from the VIP engineering and marketing company, which was the part of the escrow account money. Mr. Kikwete, however, said he had put on suspense to the Minister of Energy and Mineral, Professor Sospita Muhongo, as there is a still an ongoing investigation to determine his involvement in the scandal, and he said that he would make a decision after receiving a report from the team that he made to investigate him. The saga revolves around 203 billion Tanzanian shilling, which was held in an escrow account that was opened following a disputed capacity charges that Tanzanian electric supply company Tanesco was required to pay to the independent power uh, Tanzania Limited IPTL, which was the company involving the joint venture of the local VIP uh, company and the benchmark company from 
Malaysia. During his speech, the President of the United Republic of Tanzania also spoke about the recently held civic election, which uh, the ruling party has won over 74% of the seats. Senya Gombeswa, Ebru Africa TV, Dar es Salaam. Ebru Africa TV, clearly all over Africa, I keep on saying this all the time. Anyway, back to the news. UNICEF has declared 2014 a devastating year for children, with as many as 15 million caught in a conflict in the Central African Republic, Iraq, South Sudan, Syria, Ukraine, and the Palestinian territories. A report released by UNICEF shows that nearly 230 million children live in countries and regions affected by armed conflict, further showing that in 2014, as many as 15 million children were caught in conflict, especially in war-prone areas. The UNICEF director, Anthony Lake, declared 2014 a devastating year owing to the large number of children affected, especially in Central African Republic, Iraq, South Sudan, Syria, Ukraine and Palestine. We could also talk about Syria. 35 schools have been attacked uh, during the nine first months of 2014. 35 schools uh, resulting in the death of more than 100 children and uh, three times more children injured. In, in Iraq, uh, 700 children uh, are report, reported to have been uh, killed, uh, executed, maimed. According to UNICEF spokesperson Christophe Baulirac, significant threats also emerged to children's health and well-being, like the deadly outbreak of Ebola in West African countries, which has left thousands offered and some five million out of school. In Central African Republic, 2.3 million children have been affected by the ongoing conflict in the country, with over 10,000 believed to have been recruited into the armed groups. Over 430 children are said to have died. In South Sudan, over 750,000 children have been displaced with 320,000 living as refugees. 600 are said to have died. UNICEF indicates that some 538 children were killed and 3,370 others injured in the Palestine Gaza Strip during a 50-day war between Israel troops and Hamas militants. In Syria, UNICEF says more than 7.3 million children have been affected by the civil war, including 1.7 million who fled the country. In the neighboring Iraq, an estimate of 2.7 million children have been affected by conflict, with at least 700 believed to have been maimed or killed this year. Children were uh, maimed, uh, killed, raped, tortured, uh, and never in, in, in a recent memory has been, have been children subjected to such a uh, an extreme brutality. Last week's Taliban gunman attack on a school in Peshawar left 132 more children dead. Sierra Leone's government is threatening to jail citizens who give Ebola victims traditional funerals. Now, according to experts, such practices are contributing greatly to the spread of the deadly virus. In the neighboring country, Guinea, a ban on traditional burials or even moving bodies without official aid was put into place months ago. However, there are those disobeying the policy and able to go away with it as most violators are not being punished. <laughs> The job of health workers is far from over, as traditional barriers have continued perpetuating the spread of Ebola in local villages. 
In the era of Ebola, bodies have to be sanitized and resanitized before burial. Families are only permitted to view last rites from a distance, which is a stark contrast to their traditional beliefs. Village barriers were kissing and touching the deceased, washing a loved one's body using hands, and even bathing in that water afterwards is standard ritual. These practices are being outlawed as the virus remains active in corpses for days. Ebola is ten times more infectious in the dead than in a live Ebola victim. After partaking in such rites, many funeral participants go back to their villages and spread the virus to others. Medical experts say 70% of Ebola cases in the country have been spread through barriers. Government figures and celebrities are campaigning for safe barriers throughout West Africa, but convincing locals to trade tradition for clinical standard is no easy task. Now still within that general region, at least 26 people have been killed in a bombings in two major cities in northern Nigeria. Now, emergency workers and witnesses reported that the first blast at a bus rank in Gombe killed at least 20 people while the other six died in an explosion at a market in Bauchi. No, he said, he said everything well. A massive explosion rocked a market in Bauchi, setting the entire area ablaze as rescue workers struggled to contain the fire. Earlier on Monday, another explosion killed at least 20 people at a bus station in Gombe City not far away from Bauchi, leaving the victims burnt beyond recognition. The bomb was planted near a bus that was parked and filling up with passengers. The Boko Haram has claimed a number of attacks at bus stations targeting people who are heading to Nigeria south. According to the Council on Foreign Relations think tank, violence in the country's northeast has killed around 10,000 people this year. We wrap it up in North Africa where veteran politician Beji Saida Sebsi has been confirmed as winner of Tunisia's first free presidential poll. Now, according to the head of the Electoral Commission, Beji secured 56% of the vote in Sunday's runoff, defeating caretaker President Monsef Marzuki. Tunisians celebrating the election of the veteran politician Beji Kaid Esebsi. <laughs> Flocking to Habib Bourguiba Avenue in downtown Tunis, dancing, singing and waving the Tunisian flag and photos of Esebsi who was elected Tunisian president, beating rival and incumbent Monsef Marzuki with 55.68% of the vote against 44.32 percent. Voters expressed their happiness after learning of the result. Many voters believe the election of Esebsi will put an end to three years of suppression and deprivation. Others voiced hope that Esebsi will make conditions better for the Tunisian people. <laughs> The ballot marked the final step in Tunisia's transition to democracy after an uprising that ousted autocrat Zain el Abedin Ben Ali in 2011 and inspired the Arab Spring revolts across North Africa and the Middle East. Esebsi, a former official in Ben Ali's one party administration, recast himself as a technocrat in his secular call for Tunisia party profited from the backlash against the country's first post revolt government, which many voters blamed for turmoil after 2011.
So that wraps it up for Ebru Africa Primetime News. Do stay tuned to Ebru Africa TV for tons of laughter as we have Mama Digital coming up straight after the news. I'm Kamene Gore. It was an absolute pleasure to have you here with us tonight as we took an in-depth and a comprehensive look at what's happening around us. For myself and the entire Ebru Africa family, we're wishing you an absolutely lovely, blessed night.